doctor is in. Today I'm returning to the topic of transgender people in the sex trade, but specifically the unique health challenges that they face. I've been working with transgender women in the sex trade for about a decade now. And note, here I'm focusing on trans women, and mainly those in the sex trade. A lot of my audience here are those who are staff or volunteers working with organizations, reaching out and assisting people in prostitution and or sex trafficking survivors. And there's way too much information about this topic to cover everything, so I'll explain some of the general information and then focus on the particular demographic. I'm also going to focus mainly on male to female transition because it's really rare to see trans men or female to male as regulars in the sex trade or as victims of sex trafficking. You know, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I have a few ideas about why this is, and I think it has to do, has something to do with the sex differences in psychology and motivations for transition. I think it also has to do with the fact that while there are men who sell sex, they are in the minority, and it's mostly women who are exploited for sexual services. If you'd like more information on female to male transition, please get in touch with me via the contact information below. So for those reaching out, working with transgender people in the sex trade, it will help immensely to understand the basics of healthcare in this population. This is important because transgender people are at an increased risk of health problems and also lifelong, and they are also lifelong medical patients due to their transition. As a physician, I provide guidance about health and wellness to organizational staff working with people exploited for sex and labor, and of course this includes transgender people. In this podcast, I'd like to share some of my experiences and realities of what health and the healthcare picture of transgender people in prostitution or sexual exploitation looks like. When I first started working with transgender, I had no idea what the health issues were or how best to help. Of course, I asked the students uh, that I was working with, as well as the staff of the organization with, who had experience. I also diligently researched what I could find from well-known and well-respected sources. Not being an expert in endocrinology and not in any sort of regular medical practice, I didn't have a good way of knowing how to evaluate the information in the guidelines presented. I didn't really take the time to do that. I wasn't sure where to go. Um, but it really wasn't until recently when I started doing a deeper dive into this topic that I realized there was a lot more going on and that all the information presented out there is complete or based on sound medical advice. And unfortunately, it serves to perpetuate a particular narrative of gender ideology. For example, the long-term risks of transition interventions have been underemphasized and somewhat hidden in the literature and in doctor consultations. Another example is that the effects of the so-called puberty blocking drugs and cross-sex hormones have been deemed reversible or mostly reversible, but this is clearly not the case. For more information about these issues, I recommend the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine at scgm.org, and I'll put the link below. But I digress. So back to trans in sex trade. When I was in Thailand, I collaborated with an organization that aims to help trans women or so-called lady boys exit out of sexual exploitation into school and or work to pursue greater dreams for their lives. I served as a medical and health consultant and presented workshops to the staff and held health classes for the students, which is what their term for their beneficiaries were. The health classes included information on the current guidelines for medical and surgical transition. Although I knew that they were not getting the standard of care, it's good to know the benchmark and what is possible. I also covered patient advocacy, how to advocate for your oneself in the healthcare system, and that's something that I find can be challenging for everyone. I also covered a variety of other topics, such as caring for your skin sexually transmitted infections, making wise choices when taking medicine over the counter, nutrition, and other topics that the students wanted to learn about. I was the teacher, but they also taught me quite a lot about their lives and their experiences were like, which helped me even mum, which helped me help them even more. 
And I won't share really specific stories here, but I'll just say that what I heard from them did not exactly line up with what I was seeing and hearing in the mainstream media, particularly in the West. In many developing countries, holistic and comprehensive care for transgender people is lacking. Sure, Thailand is a destination for transgender people desiring surgery and medications to transform their bodies, but that doesn't mean the care is holistic, and it certainly doesn't mean it's available to people with a low socioeconomic status. And that's true for most of the medical tourism, for which Thailand is increasingly becoming famous. The transition process for trans at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, usually those are the ones in the sex trade, is often bit by bit doing the procedures and taking the medicines as they can afford to go. Many do sex work in order to fund future surgeries or other interventions. Now, I'm not saying that I think that medical transition is a healthcare right and that it should be funded by government insurance schemes. I don't. Nor do I want to make it easier for anyone for any reason to sell sex in order to fund their transition or school or whatever reason they give for selling sex. But I do believe that people need to be access, be able to access medical care and consultations and receive treatment at a reasonable cost. Again, you know, that's headed towards another rabbit hole. So most of the trans women I assisted did not have any medical supervision regarding their transition regimen. They get information from their friends and other trans women. They do not know the proper doses of hormones and do not understand the risks associated with the medications, let alone medications that are not designed for this purpose, such as taking mega doses of oral contraceptives. There are research articles that confirm my experience, and I'll link those below. Well, these, these people get hormones over the counter from pharmacies or from their friends. They get silicone implants with dodgy procedures and injections with materials of dubious safety. They apply other non-pharmaceutical body modifications with sometimes deleterious side effects. And all this to try to make their bodies look like something they are not. Unfortunately, this often does not lead to satisfaction. The dissatisfaction and disappointment leads to more mental distress, which leads to more interventions, which will not help. But more on that on in the mental health section below. My goal has always been to support the health and well-being of these individuals. This includes understanding some of the general medical issues, such as HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, as well as aspects of transition medicine. Now, transgender medicine is rapidly evolving. It must also be said that a lot of what is known in this field is new and untested, especially when it comes to understanding the long-term effects of some of these interventions. Some of the medical practices are still considered exper experimental. Moreover, a lot of the trans people are not following any regimen. Uh, what they are taking is what they're learning on the street. Unfortunately, there's a dearth of physicians and other health professionals who are knowledgeable and or comfortable addressing transgender health issues regarding transition or other general health problems. And a lot of this, as I said before, is, is wrapped up in political correctness. To complicate, to complicate matters due to shame, stigma, discrimination, and prior bad experiences, transgender people may be reluctant to visit clinics and hospitals for even routine problems. The harm, whether intentional or unintentional, experienced through individuals in the healthcare system can be long-lasting and impedes proper care. I have found this to be true of many people in prostitution or survivors of sex trafficking and not just the trans. Immigration status can also play a significant factor in accessing healthcare. Trans in Brazil face a high degree of stigma and discrimination, and they will often travel, if they can, to other countries to escape this, as well as to seek transition interventions. There are actually quite a few Brazilian transgender women in certain European cities. And you can learn more about this by going to a couple of my prior podcasts where I speak to people working in Italy and France uh, for more on that situation. So let's talk more specifically about transition. I'm going to provide only a brief overview of what this entails. 
So transitioning, no matter if male to female or female to male, is the process of transitioning from presenting as one's natal sex to the opposite sex. The process can involve any or all of the following. Social transition in the form of changing your name, pronouns, body modifications such as breast binders or penis tucking, puberty blockers such as gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs, or cross-sex hormones like estrogen or testosterone, and surgical modifications such as vaginoplasty, phalloplasty, mastectomy, breast implants, and so forth. Since I don't want to turn this into a podcast uh, in the form of a medical lecture, I'm not going to describe the processes in detail, but I will list more links uh, below so you can find out more. Transition is a lengthy and difficult process, and it is in many ways remains experimental, and the patient must commit to lifelong medicalization. There are profound, irreversible challenges, as well as serious and ongoing risks to the person undergoing it. While the impetus for transition is a psychological one, the transition, the transition regimen causes further challenges and changes to the physiological as well as the psychological makeup of an individual, which can complicate the whole picture of health. You know, it might be that some people who want to transition had no idea what they were getting into at the outset if they did not have proper initial guidance. The stress and the cost of having to maintain this regimen can be high and sometimes much higher than anticipated. But it's kind of like when you go forward, then it's kind of you reach a point of no return and then you're going to be pushed to going forward because to go back involves, well, sometimes it's irreversible or sometimes the amount of shame uh, to detransition or to reverse can be quite, quite difficult. So it's important to not assume that every transgender person desires the same outcomes for transition, socially or physical. Some prefer to remain more or less androgynous, and some prefer to go all out towards a hyper-female presentation. Medical oversight of transition may not be available, affordable, or even desired. Often, especially in resource-poor areas and in areas where hormones and other kinds of drugs are easy to acquire without a prescription, trans people will take medications without medical oversight. For example, trans women uh, in Thailand will take several over-the-counter birth control pills daily for years. Uh, needless to say, this is a very off-label use and, and can be dangerous. Visits to a clinic regarding transition could include discussing hormone therapy, surgical care, anticipatory guidance, discussion of risks and side effects, but it's unclear just how comprehensive these visits really are and most likely is far from ideal. A lot of doctors won't bother to do any mental health screening or discuss the risks at length. They simply give the patients what they think the patients want. You know, the patients think they want this, and, and so they'll happily, they'll happily do the surgery. Uh, they'll happily take their money. But, so if you have a good relationship with someone going through transition, it might be worth exploring some of this territory just to see what they know and what they expect and if they've considered the risks and what questions and concerns do they have and is the doctor addressing these. You know, this is different from trying to talk someone out of transition or into transition. It's simply helping people understand the risks involved and making sure that their consent is truly informed. This is ethical and this is caring. So regarding the general physical health, you know, people who have been sexually exploited have health problems beyond their sexual reproductive parts. You know, that's true for men, women, trans. You know, it seems to me that a lot of the research revolves around the attitude that they are vectors of disease to the general population. But we need to consider them as whole people and that they could be suffering from a variety of other problems, including infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, chronic diseases, such as asthma, non-infectious diseases like back pain, injuries such as occupational injuries or head trauma, and of course mental health, you know, as well as general reproductive health problems. You know, sexual and reproductive health is of course a major concern. You know, transgender people in the sex trade tend to have high rates of 
sexually transmitted infections. HIV can be as high as 25% in some studies in some populations. 25%. That's about what it was um, in Thailand. They also tend to be subjected to more physical and sexual violence. You know, transgender women may or may not, or, you know, likely not, have had bottom surgery, uh, which is the castration and possibly a vaginoplasty. And they may be having sex with both men and women. So here's a pro tip. If you have several sizes of condoms available, ask what size they need instead of assuming because you have to know, well, are they, what kind of sex are they having? Another reproductive health aspect to consider is that medical and surgical transition will usually cause infertility or at least a greatly reduced fertility. This is an important aspect of pre-transition counseling that should not be overlooked. So the mental health of transgender people is serious and very complex. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of political correctness involved, which creates a difficult environment for objective and comprehensive assessment of what are the true issues and how we can best address them. Uh, the same is true, of course, for physical health care and transition. The journeys to transition and identifying as transgender are widely variable. Gender dysphoria is a real phenomenon but is usually not the only mental health problem that people who identify as transgender have. There is quite a lot of psychological distress in these individuals and is complicated by other psychological comorbidities. Transgender individuals have high rates of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, self-harm, and suicide. There is an increased prevalence of autism spectrum disorder, among transgender people, and they demonstrate higher rates of high-risk attachment patterns, as well as a high rate of unresolved trauma complicating the mental health picture. So gender dysphoria can cause mental health distress, but not all distressing symptoms are caused by gender dysphoria. Correlation does not equal causation. Often, these other issues were pre present before the onset of gender dysphoria. It bears mentioning that the current diagnostic criteria in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version 5 or DSM-5 for gender dysphoria is extremely regressive and subjective, basically relying on 1950s stereotypical behaviors of boys and girls to determine whether or not one actually identifies as the opposite sex. And it's as if tomboy girls and Quiet boys are pathological and un unacceptable ways to grow up. It's also important to note that puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones affect mood and cognition, which can distort the accurate picture of an individual's mental state. These mental health issues may not resolve with transition, and sometimes the distress can worsen because of the lack of resolution despite drastic modifications, powerful drugs, and spending loads of money. The drugs themselves can lead to mental instability and cognitive issues, as well as clouded judgment, especially in the adolescent and young adult development when the body and brain are still forming. Discrimination and stigma are huge problems and often experienced by trans people to a high degree, and they do exacerbate mental health problems. However, not all mental health difficulties are caused by the discrimination. Taking estrogen and suppressing testosterone decreases libido and sexual function. And it's claimed that transition generally leaves symptoms of gender dysphoria and associated distress, but studies fail to show that there is a significant decrease in suicidal thinking and suicide completion with or without transition. The mental health challenges experienced by transgender people in the sex trade are compounded by the traumatic experiences of ex sexual exploitation and prostitution or trafficking. Furthermore, transgender people, as with most people in the sex trade, have a history of child abuse and neglect, as well as other childhoods, as well as other adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Chronic and early trauma impacts a person's mental health in profound ways, including the high probability of alcohol and or drug addiction, disordered eating, self-harm, and other serious problems. So moving on to the long-term and preventive health measures, 
there are important long-term and preventive health implications for transgender people. No transition, including social, non-pharmaceutical, medical, and surgical, has profound and long-lasting impacts on a person's health. There are interventions being done for which we have no idea what the long-term consequences are, especially the ones that are being done on children. You know, in the past, it's been mostly adults who have transitioned, and now we're seeing these interventions be done at an ever younger age. The surgeries are very complicated and are fraught with risks and long-term and irreversible complications. Many of these surgeries involve the amputation of healthy organs for which our bodies were designed to have and function and that can impact the rest of the body for life. Consider that every cell in your body is imprinted with either an XX or XY stamp and are designed to function and interact in a certain way with a certain combination of hormones. We are simply not a Mr. or Mrs. Potato Head with interchangeable parts depending on what one feels like. When these natural hormonal balances are altered, this can have serious consequences. The areas of concern include, but are not limited to, increased risk of cancer, heightened cardiovascular risks, decreased bone mineral, bone mineral density leading to osteoporosis, impaired fertility, you know, fatigue, substance use, and the above described mental health issues. And so basically, a lot of this risk comes down to a lower life expectancy for trans individuals. There are also some concerns about reduced cognitive development and executive function, which is the ability to make rational decisions. And that needs to have a lot more study. General fatigue is also a very common complaint. Now, health professionals need to make sure that we are screening for important diseases relevant to their natal sex, such as cervical cancer or heightened risk of cardiovascular disease in transgender men or testicular or prostate cancer in transgender women. There are a growing number of research articles and data that elucidate these consequences. It's important to note that most people considering transition are not properly warned of these health risks, health risks during the informed consent process. So if you're assisting someone considering transition in the midst of transition or contemplating detransition, it may be important to know resources for which you can refer to help them make informed choices. This is about never doing transition, but I think that the weight of these risks is being taken far too lightly. So in conclusion, it's vitally important to note that the goal is to help these individuals as be as healthy as possible and that assisting people and advocating for their health care is not necessarily endorsement of transition. There are many areas of health and wellness that do not involve the process of transition, such as screening for sexually transmitted infections, addressing chronic health problems, meeting mental health needs, and promoting preventive health care. We need to care for the person in front of us. Understanding the health aspects of transition can go a long way to understanding and helping a transgender person. An individual can still help transgender people stay healthy and support their overall well-being and not agree to participate in transition. Remember that many, if not most, transgender in the sex trade, especially in developing countries, take dangerous regimens of over-the-counter hormone cocktails or doing harmful non-pharmaceutical practices without the, without the oversight of medical professionals. So I'm currently working on a handbook with a group of others in this sector that provides more information and practical guidance for anyone interested in assisting trans people in the sex trade. This includes health aspects, but also a variety of other topics such as outreach and aftercare assistance, how do we offer hospitality, and how do we be a good neighbor. If you would like to be notified and when this is available and how you can request a copy, please sign up for my newsletter below. So this, my friends, is the end of this podcast about health care for transgender people in the sex trade. I hope that you learned a lot. I Just a brief overview. Once again, there's so much more to talk about here. I could go on and on, but in the interest of your time, uh, I can always come back and go into more detail later. So whatever would be helpful for you to know, 
I'd love to know that. Please drop a comment below and get in touch with me if you'd like to discuss this more in a consultation or, or whatever. I'm here to help you help people. So my friends, have a great day. Get it in the sunshine. Make some vitamin D and enjoy the day. Have a great one. Until next time. See you later. Bye.